Good afternoon. Welcome, Ambassador Jamaliev, other distinguished guests to the Betsy and Walter Stern Conference Center of Hudson Institute. I'm Ken Weinstein, President and CEO of Hudson Institute. Hudson is a future-oriented international policy research organization that this year celebrates 50 years of forging ideas that promote security, prosperity, and freedom. We have a long history of work on Central Asia and U.S. national security, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's conference on the political situation in Kyrgyzstan, implications for the United States. As you know, the Manas Transit Center outside the Kyrgyz capital of Bishkek is a vital supply link for U.S. and NATO forces fighting in Afghanistan. The link has become more important over the past few months in the aftermath of the bin Laden targeted assassination as differences between the United States and Pakistan have become increasingly apparent. Against this backdrop and that of a changing U.S. troop posture in Afghanistan, the political situation in Kyrgyzstan has undergone dramatic change. A democratic revolution, as we know, that overthrew former President Bakiyev, followed by the adoption of a new constitution that has made Kyrgyzstan a parliamentary republic. How do these internal changes in Kyrgyzstan affect U.S. interests at a time that the northern supply route for the war effort in Pakistan has taken on increased significance? To discuss this question and others, we have, distinguished, we have gathered a, a distinguished panel of experts who will be introduced shortly. Uh, this event, I should note in the interest of disclosure, uh, has been uh, underwritten in part uh, with uh, support from uh, the Minor Corporation, from Minor Corp. Minor Corp, as you know, with a very modest grant, I should say, that does not uh, even go uh, to covering the full extent of uh, the event and the lunches that uh, we are uh, offering you today. The Minor Corp, as you know, uh, holds a uh, contract with the Department of Defense to provide jet fuel at the Manas Air Base in Kyrgyzstan, we, and we uh, appreciate uh, the subvention for this event. Uh, we at Hudson Institute maintain full intellectual control over the selection of the panelists and uh, on the discussion today. And we thought the event was worth doing given the political changes in Kyrgyzstan and of course uh, the uncertainty surrounding the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. I now have the pleasure of uh, turning the microphone over to my colleague David Satter, a senior fellow at Hudson Institute who will moderate today's discussion. David is the author of uh, two books that have appeared with the Yale University Press, uh, Age of Delirium, The Decline and Fall of the Soviet Union, published in 1996, which is shortly going to be coming out as a uh, documentary, which we all look forward to its appearance, Darkness at Dawn, The Rise of the Russian Criminal State, uh, which was published in 2003, and forthcoming in November, it was a long time ago, and it never happened anyway, Russia and the Communist past. And David, of course, is the former Moscow correspondent of the Financial Times and needs no introduction. David. Okay. Well, thank you, Ken. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, make sure that my microphone's working. First of all, is it? Yeah? Okay. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our panelists and uh, to moderate this uh, discussion of the situation in Kyrgyzstan and what it means for the United States. I'm going to ask our panelists to limit their remarks to about 15 minutes each. Uh, I know e there's, there's not one of you that uh, doesn't have a lot more to say than uh, 15 minutes worth, but in the interest of discussion and uh, uh, kind of an interactive event, uh, we're going to uh, try to keep the initial presentations short. I uh, was for many years a correspondent in the Soviet Union, and I was proud of the fact that I traveled all over the country. There were only three republics that I didn't visit of the 15. Uh, Molda Moldavia was one of them, but in Central Asia, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan at that time, the capital of Bishkek was called Frunze, and it seemed so remote and uh, so little involved in the events of the world that I constantly put off uh, the plans that I had to go there. But times have changed, and Kyrgyzstan today is an extremely important country for the United States and for the world, because it is through Kyrgyzstan, as, as we well know, 
that the supply for the that the supplies for the war effort in Afghanistan are 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 being channeled uh, in addition to other supply routes. So, without uh, further <laughs> delay, I'd like to introduce the first of our speakers, uh, Sheradil Bakhtagulov, who is, uh, in fact, well, Sheradil, uh, yeah, I maybe I know I. I, I uh, <laughs> Who is a uh, the, the director? I believe the director of an organ. I don't have it written here, but I know in fact because yeah. I know you uh, <laughs> is the uh, is the director of a uh, of an organization to strengthen parliamentary democracy in Kyrgyzstan. Is that a fair description? And a USAID contractor of many years. He is uh, uh, well versed in the internal uh, dynamics of this present situation in Kyrgyzstan and will now give us his view of the country's progress toward democracy. Good morning everyone. Probably, uh, probably I, am, I am a little bit tall for this mic. <laughs> And good morning, everyone. And first of all, I would like to uh, thank the Hutton Institute for giving such great opportunity to myself uh, being today, tomorrow with you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming today and for your time dedicated to this panel. And first, I would like to continue in Russian. In fact, my Russian, I think, much more academic than my English. Sure, sure idea. Let me, let me interrupt. Please, on your... Uh on your translation devices, you want channel one. And I'm also obliged to remind everyone not to take these with you. They aren't party favors. We have to, uh, we have to give them back. <laughs> so turn to the first channel, and you'll hear the, uh, the simultaneous translation of Sheridil's remarks. Thank you. Actually, I forgot that uh, you'll new uh, use a translation device. So let me just continue. Uh, так как многие из вас являются uh, специалистами по uh, изучению стран Центральной Азии, в частности Казахстана, я в своем выступлении не буду останавливаться на подробных деталях, указаниям лиц и так далее. Uh, сегодня я uh, остановлюсь только на одном моменте, а именно о том, почему та ситуация, которая сложилась в Кыргызстане, uh, до сих пор имеет место быть, несмотря на произошедшие два события, приведших к смене двух президентов. Да? То есть это март 2005 года и апрель 2010 года. А, в этой связи мне хотелось бы обратить ваше внимание на то, что главным достижением Конституции 2010 года а, стало распределение суперпрезидентских полномочий между а, премьер-министром с одной стороны и парламентом с другой стороны. Ну, в принципе, это является как раз основой, стала основой, заложила основу острого обмена а, мнениями и так далее между а, президентом, между премьер-министром и парламентом. Ну, я не думаю, что эта а, ситуация как-то осложняется. В принципе, это хороший а, знак, это как бы признак а, рост политического роста, да, кризис политического роста. Вот. Но э, хотелось бы обратить ваше внимание на то, что э, который часто есть такой один момент, который часто упускается из виду, а именно э, правящие режимы э, в странах Центральной Азии, ну и Кыргызстан не стал исключением, э, возникали на основе сращивания власти и бизнеса, в первую очередь крупного бизнеса. И э, власть, стремясь поддержать свое могущество, не только на... Э, ограничивала а, какие-то элементы демократии, да, но и а, прибирала к рукам наиболее важные отрасли экономики и стремилась как раз извлекать выгоду из распоряжения судьбой этих предприятий. Ну и в результате на сегодняшний день а, мы знаем, что Кыргызстан маленькая страна и крупных бизнесменов мало, да, но зачастую нет четкой разницы между высокопоставленным чиновником и крупным предпринимателем, бизнесменом. И вот в этой ситуации а, получилась такая практика, что органы государственной власти, государственного управления а, крупными бизнесменами рассматриваются как элементы бизнес-стратегии по, по обеспечению не просто а, 
конкурентных преимуществ, а монопольного положения своего предприятия или своего бизнеса. И вот этот подход как раз таки является решающим для того, чтобы понимать взаимоотношения, которые складываются между политиками и крупными бизнесменами, включая в том числе иностранных, желающих работать в стране. Вот. И в этой связи хотелось бы заметить, что развитие ситуации, внутриполитической ситуации в Кыргызстане, оно не привело к изменению сложившихся а в конце 1990-х годов неформальных отношений во власти. Да? То есть, опять же, крупный бизнес и а, политики. И также не привело, в принципе, а, к изменению отношений между властью и простыми людьми, да? большая часть населения. И а, хотел бы заметить, что а, вот эта тенденция, она с каждым годом нарастает. То есть растет отчуждение власти от населения. И в результате складываются два параллельных мира. Да? С одной стороны, мир политиков крупного бизнеса и лиц, которые вовлечены во взаимоотношения между ними. Ну и с другой стороны, это получается все остальные. Почему важно это понимать? А, дело в том, что а, развитие и политической, и экономической ситуации в Кыргызстане после апрельских событий 2010 года показывает, что крупный бизнес, в общем-то, сращенный уже с властью, продолжает прежнюю практику. Да, установ... Это первое, установление контроля над природными ресурсами, второе, установление контроля над высокодоходными компаниями и третье, установление контор... контроля над системами перераспределения ресурсов. И вот такое отношение, оно приводит не к ожидаемой модернизации страны, которая была провозглашена, а к обогащению э, бюрократии и возможной дальнейшей деградации общества. В результате э, сегодня простые люди э, полагаются на собственные возможности связи. Э, то есть укрепляется уверенность в том, что именно неформальные связи и нормы, и правила да, помогают э, противодействовать ну, э, волонтаристскому толкованию и использованию э, властями придержащими правовых норм. И такая ситуация приводит к тому, что а, те хорошие, а, благие намерения а, по борьбе с коррупцией, предпринимаемые и государственными, и международными организациями, ну, сводятся к нулю. А, опять же, в этой связи в Кыргызстане пока еще не сложился парламент, а, который мог бы представлять интересы широких социальных слоев. То есть, и вследствие этого парламент продолжает представлять интересы малой части общества. Да? Ну и, как правило, а, это интересы, опять же, а, сегмент все той же самой правящей элиты, да? включая бизнесменов и так далее. И а, получается так, что интересы а, большинства граждан продолжают игнорироваться, они не учитываются. И вот из-за этого граждане пытаются искать а, другие пути, методы защиты своих интересов. Ну и включая иногда противоправные, да? Чем, в принципе, объясняется природа появления и обращения для разрешения каких-либо споров к местным криминальным авторитетам. Да? И а, здесь мне хотелось бы остановиться еще на одном моменте, если время позволит. Да? А, дело в том, что, а, как вы знаете, 15 июня произош... а, состоялся саммит глав государств Шанхайской организации сотрудничества. И а, там произошли несколько таких замечательных встреч. Да? Традиционные а, консультации между делегациями России и Узбекистана, России и Казахстана. И что раньше никогда не было, это консультации между делегациями а, Казахстана и Узбекистана. А учитывая то, что а, 14 июня в преддверии этого саммита а, президент Медведев посещал а, с визитом Ташкент, и э, там обсуждались такие очень хорошие вопросы. Э, например, э, было такое замечательное высказывание о том, что в свете тех событий, которые произошли в начале этого года, известные как «Арабская весна», и э, те процессы, которые запущены и происходят в этих странах, не могут не беспокоить российскую сторону, да? И, соответственно, проводилась небольшая параллель с теми событиями, которые могут произойти в Центральной Азии. Ну, как вы знаете, Кыргызстан является на сегодняшний день той страной, которая часто ассоциируется а, странами региона как раз в связи с а, процессами, запущенными арабской весной. И тогда возникает все-таки такой вопрос. Да? Если происходит обсуждение вопросов безопасности, а, 
вопросов безопасности именно в контексте обеспечения а, стабильности в регионе. Ну и тогда получается так, какая же роль будет все-таки предусмотрена Кыргызстану в связи с ассоциацией с арабской весной 2011 года. Да? И будет ли рассматриваться эта страна как потенциальная угроза в долгосрочной перспективе для тех устоявшихся отношений в странах, да, таких как Казахстан, Узбекистан, Туркменистан. И э, дело в том, что получается так, что если мы войдем, рассмотрим воедино э, ту ситуацию, которая у нас сложилась э, из-за природы возникновения крупного бизнеса и власти, то есть сращивания крупного бизнеса с властью. А второе, как вы знаете, на этом я не останавливался и, наверное, не буду останавливаться, действия политиков, они вольно или невольно, разнонаправленные. Да? То есть не прослеживается четкая ориентация на преследование каких-либо интересов, в первую очередь, национального плана, да? странового характера. И третье, заинтересованность и, в принципе, консолидированные действия а, высокопоставленных лиц и Казахстана, России и Узбекистана, то, в принципе, получается неутешительная картина для будущего развития страны. Вот. Ну и как раз-таки парадокс ситуации заключается в том, что если будет принято решение о том, чтобы предпринимать какие-то действия в отношении Кыргызстана а, с тем, чтобы установить а, полный контроль да, над страной, в принципе, большинство населения не возражает против этого. Это наоборот. Получается так, что сегодняшнее положение в Кыргызстане не может уже служить основой для долгосрочного развития страны. Ну и вот без относительно того, что может произойти в страной, мне хотелось бы остановиться на том, что несмотря на те процессы, которые запущены, есть два весьма положительных момента. Первый момент. Дело в том, что необходимость экономического существования, она толкает людей местные сообщества искать пути получения независимых от власти средств да, для того, чтобы обеспечить а, минимальные параметры, минимальные стандарты а, для своего проживания. И вот в этой связи очень хороший тренд это, что невозможно блокировать рыночное предпринимательство. Да? И как мы знаем а, на примере а, тех стран, которые а, прошли через этот путь, и страны, которые ну, представители власти не блокировали, не допускали бюрократизацию экономики, это как, например, Южная Корея, Турция, Малайзия и так далее. Да, да это страны с сильной, как вы знаете, может быть, даже в свое время автократической системы управления, но предпринимали силы для того, чтобы не допустить бюрократизацию экономику. И основа рыночного предпринимательства привела к тому, что люди начали затем выступать с требованиями политической свободы. А второе, в Кыргызстане, в принципе, появляются уже примеры таких консолидированных действий, да, когда представители малого, среднего бизнеса объединяются и для того, чтобы продвигать свои интересы. Например, года 4-5 назад у нас в тени находились представители швейной промышленности. Но обороты дошли на высок, вышли на достаточно высокий уровень, когда потребовалось их легализация. Если раньше на швейников насчитывалось порядка 80 тысяч человек, то на сегодняшний день их а, насчитывается а, около 200 тысяч человек. Ну, а, для масштаба США, может быть, это небольшие цифры, но для масштаба Кыргызстана это достаточно а, солидная а, цифра, учитывая то, что у нас в стране 5 миллионов населения. А, еще два примера. Это то, что в этом году законопроект а, о поддержки ювелирной промышленности был принят в первом чтении. Вот. Почему это важно для Кыргызстана? У нас никогда раньше не было ювелирной промышленности. Вот. Она была, начала свою работу подпольно, нелегально, порядка 5-7 лет назад. И, соответственно, опять же, обороты и, опять же, рыночная экономика привела к тому, что надо легализоваться, надо легализовывать доходы и дальше продвигаться. И это было выражено в этом законопроекте. Третий закон, который был принят буквально месяц назад, это закон о создании парка высоких технологий. Этот закон продвигался три года и был инициирован рядом компаний, опять же, малого среднего бизнеса, да, занимающихся разработкой программного обеспечения для ряда японских компаний. И опять же, обороты стали настолько высокими, что надо легализовываться. 
И вот, вот эти инициативы как раз показывают, да, что в противовес крупному бизнесу а, все-таки возникает а, та сила, которая а, может стать основой для того, чтобы заложить будущее, процветающее будущее Кыргызстана. И в завершение мне хотелось бы акцентировать ваше внимание на том, что а, участниками, активными участниками а, событий марта 2005 года и апреля 2010 года, это те люди, которые выходили на площадь, стояли в первых рядах, это были как раз таки представители малого и микробизнеса. И а, в этой связи, в завершении, мне хотелось бы выразить а, увер, уверенность в том, что а, мы сможем с вами расставить акценты над тем, что действительно происходит в Кыргызстане и, наверное, совместными усилиями разработать какие-либо действия, которые могут э, послужить на благо двух стран, да, Соединенных Штатов Америки и Кыргызской Республики. Спасибо большое за внимание. Our next speaker is Miriam Lanskoy, who is the director for Russia and Eurasia at the National Endowment for Democracy. She's also the co-author with uh, Ilya Sakhmedov, the former Chechen foreign minister, of a book, of a recent book on the, uh, the Chechen war entitled The Chechen Struggle, Independence Won and Lost. Uh, I, in fact, uh, was one of those who uh, wrote blurbs for this book. And uh, I can tell you that it's w extremely lucid and uh, enlightening uh, analysis of the forces that uh, affected Chech the, the Chechen society during these many long years of war. Uh, Miriam has traveled frequently uh, to Central Asia and to Kyrgyzstan and is a, an acute and astute observer of the democratic process in that country. I might seem taller. Um, thank you, David. I uh, really appreciate uh, this opportunity to, to speak here, and thanks also for uh, mentioning the book. Um, I, I've been working on democracy assistance, and for your praise of it, um, I've been working on democracy assistance programs in Kyrgyzstan since 2003. I've traveled there frequently, been all over the country, and I've seen two revolutions um, happen there, and I've met many of the key personalities involved in, in, in those events. Um, overall, I think that uh, there have been import important achievements in civil society and in political processes since the 2010 revolution. The biggest disappointment and failure of the, cur of the current government is related to nationalism and ethnic conflict and the aftermath of the OSH events of a year ago. And I'm going to take those uh, topics in that order. I'll uh, start with civil society, political processes, and then nationalism and ethnic conflict. Uh, compared to the Bakiyev period, uh, today there is less fear, there is less repression, and there is much greater space for civil society. Um, I was there in the fall of 2009, which was the, my most disturbing visit to Kyrgyzstan. Um, opposition politicians were going into exile or they were going into jail. Journalists were being beaten. Um, grantees were asking me, did you have trouble getting a visa? Because so many of their international uh, partners were not able to visit them in Kyrgyzstan. They were feeling increasingly isolated. And uh, the kinds of conversations I was having with my partners there were, were along the lines of, um, could it become like Uzbekistan? What are the limits to how constricted the Baikiev government could become? And that's a few months before the revolution. Um, so since then, I think we've seen tremendous uh, d degree of improvement for civil society. There's work with trade unions, there's work with um, independent youth movements, 
uh, throughout the country in different universities that just wasn't possible two, three years ago. Um, similarly, local branches of political parties um, work that used to be uh, barely possible to carry out is now in the open and um, much more uh, fruitful than it had been earlier. Um, the response of human rights NGOs to the crisis of 2010 for me was extremely impressive. People worked within their mandate. They were very courageous. Um, they defended victims regardless of nationality. They were very organized and they cooperated well with each other. So I was impressed overall by the way that um, Kyrgyz civil society responded, both at the local level, very grassroots activists, and larger organizations in Bishkek. I thought that they came through in a crisis. Um, overall, I think our grantees in Kyrgyzstan are doing better today than, there were, than they were in 2008, 2009. And the exception to that, the big exception to that, is Azimjan Askarov, who's been a grantee of the NED for many years. He's an Uzbek human rights defender who is um, unfairly in prison. He was framed, and he was not, not framed. There was a case manufactured against him. Um, and it's clearly a, a situation where the police is settling scores with a local human rights defender. And uh, his case is symptomatic of a larger problem, which is of Uzbeks in the South and the absence of justice um, in, in those situations. Um, turning to political processes, uh, the October 2010 parliamentary election was the best election ever in Central Asia. It was competitive and it was largely free and fair. All the main political constituencies are represented in parliament. There are five parties in parliament. The exception are the Uzbeks and I'll turn to that. Um, some of the parties, particularly Atajurt, are anti-democratic and ultra-nationalist. Others are corrupt. Some might have Russian sponsors. Um, however, at the same time, they are all working within the system, and they all have a stake in that system. Um, there are many political scandals. There are allegations of corruption. There was a fist fight in parliament. There are procedural and bureaucratic turf battles. And there's constant squabbles that undermine the political class, ruin their reputation. Um, they are due in part to the institution being very new and kind of procedural politics is fought out through procedural battles in addition to policy battles. But this seems partly because of the newness of the system. Uh, turning to the upcoming presidential elections, the incumbent, the interim president, Rosa Tambayeva, is not running. And this is unique for the region where all other presidents found pretexts to extend, extend their mandates. The presidential election most, will most likely be extremely competitive. The biggest threat is that a free election can bring in an authoritarian president. Um, and a lot in that regard depends on the tactics chosen by smaller democratic or you know, more or less centrist parties. Um, if they draw the right conclusions from the way that the parliamentary election, from the results of the parliamentary elections, the smaller parties will combine behind the strongest candidate. Most likely that candidate would be the prime minister at Tambayev. Um, if the smaller parties choose to all run different candidates and you have you know, five people running from the different, more or less democratic, let's say centrist parties. They will divide the vote and there might be only authoritarians in the second round. So clearly a lot depends on their ability to um, strategize and work together. Uh, the situation is far from perfect, but there is hope that over time, if um, civil society continues to grow stronger, you continue to have good elections, um, the institutions of civil society, the media, voters, uh, will discipline the political class. Um, turning to what I see as the biggest disappointment and con continuing challenge for Kyrgyzstan is a problem of nationalism and ethnic violence. Uh, there are persistent and exaggerated scenarios 
of Kyrgyz victimhood. Existential threats to the state. The state might disappear, the Kyrgyz language might die out, the state can be swallowed up or it can divide. There's constant um, talk of just uh, that, that Kyrgyzstan might not survive, which is clearly very exaggerated. And that feeds into the nationalism. At the same time, there's a national revival, especially an increased use of Kyrgyz language. This is a very difficult adjustment for the Russian-speaking part of the population, and some of those people are ethnic Kyrgyz also, who just don't have the language and, are, and find it difficult to, uh, to, to shift. But it is not a different dilemma than other parts of the former Soviet space. Its issue is coming up a bit later in Kyrgyzstan, but it, it is, in principle, a familiar problem. Um, specifically on the violence of May and June of 2010. This was the biggest um, uh, conflict in Central Asia in 20 years. It had nothing to do with Islam. It had nothing to do with jihadis or overflow from Afghanistan, which is different from what we've been hearing from Central Asia analysts um, about the sort of conflict poten potential of Central Asia. It did not spread through the Fergana Valley, and it lasted about a week, and it, had, it was localized in one area. There were approximately 480 confirmed deaths. At the time, it was estimated that it would be by far more than that, more like 10,000. Um, in my view, the most important factors leading to that violence were political factors. Um, the provisional government that had come to power in April could not extend its uh, could not extend the revolution to the south without the support of the Uzbeks. This was particularly true in Jalalabad in 20 in um, in May of 2010. They needed the support of local Uzbeks. This is documented well in the Kyrgyzstan Inquiry Report. Um, and they used them to remove Baikiev loyalists and to burn um, the homes of the Baikiev family. But especially looking ahead to parliamentary elections, the provisional government was not going to take the side of local Uzbeks against local Kyrgyz in the south. So they permitted um, the, the massacres or pogroms um, to happen. Um, the, it was clear, and also, uh, again, in, in May, June, that the Uzbek leaders who supported the provisional government ex expected greater political participation for the, uh, for the local Uzbek population, particularly in local government. Um, the, the provisional government that was not then going to uh, uh, provide uh, uh, support or protection for them um, when the pay payback happened uh, a little bit later in Osh. Uh, and the aftermath, uh, the Uzbek population is being um, uh, extorted by police and security apparatus. There's manipulation of how the, re the rebuilding and restoration is happening in a way to undermine um, the mahalas or the way, the way that uh, traditional uh, forms of the, of the Uzbek community. There's um, uh, completely disproportionate uh, uh, arrests, detention, torture um, of, of Uzbeks in that area that's continuing. There's a very de detailed Human Rights Watch um, report on those issues. And it's clear that in the near future, um, the Uzbeks will not emerge as a kind of political community. Uh, they, they will not be able to participate um, as they had hoped, that as clearly they had articulated um, in, in May. Um, the challenge now is to defend human rights and preserve minority communities. There, there, there isn't really a possibility of them emerging in a, in a larger way. Um, and the biggest, and I think this is, this is the biggest disappointment, is the failure to kind of um, define Kyrgyzstan as a multi-ethnic um, uh, state. Um, in conclusion, um, I think Kyrgyzstan overall is better off. The revolution of 2010 <coughs> opened the way to authentic reform in the political system, much more so than the revolution of 2005. 
this is today, um, uh, it's clear today that there's greater freedom for civil society and there are competi competitive political processes. If Kyrgyzstan can avoid sliding into authoritarianism, and if present trends continue, the trajectory can be a good one. Over time, the institutions of civil society and the media will become stronger, and the regular elections will discipline um, the, the politicians. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, Miriam. Our third speaker is uh, Sayed Bek Usmanov, uh, who's the director of the Central Asian Free Market Institute. He's presently directing a project uh, on Kyrgyzstan, a policy handbook, as well as a guide for, the, uh, uh, for understanding the systems of taxation in both Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Uh, Sayed Bek. Thank you. Hello, hi. My name is Seyed Bek Usmanov. Uh, Will you speak uh, Russian or English? Uh, English. English, okay. Uh, back when <coughs> my biography was written on the, on the organization's website, we were writing the Kyrgyzstan Policy Handbook, but we finished it. I brought a bunch of copies. I saw <laughs> some of you took it. Uh, I think they're over there on the table. Uh, I have one copy. If somebody wants, I can give. <laughs> uh, okay. I have a PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so the title of my presentation, I'll come down, is Kyrgyzstan legal flying in circles uh, the past 20 years. Uh, I took that name of the, I like it, from the article by Eric McClinchy from the Mason University. He wrote an article back in April 9th, oh, back in April 9th, 2000, 2010, two days after the revolution, he wrote an article and I was, I didn't believe him that everything is happening in circles in Kyrgyzstan. But now, one year later, I, I... He was right. So that's why I liked, I, I'm using it. Uh, so so, so the th there are three points I want to make in my presentation. First is that in Kyrgyzstan, in politics and economics, it, Kyrgyz eagles, or the leadership of the country is flying in circles, rip everything repeating. And currently, okay. uh, this, with this state of uh, affairs, Kyrgyzstan is a flip-flop partner for, for the US. Uh, unreliable, and in order for the U.S. to have a reliable partner, the U.S. should support liberal youth or new generation of people who will not be flip-flops, who will be reformers. So, has there been a reform political leadership change in Kyrgyzstan? I think no. Why? Because l if you look at the people, Rosa Otumbayeva, Atambayev, Keldebekov, top three people in Kyrgyzstan. Atumbayeva is the president, she was Akayev's and Bakiev's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Atambay was Bakiev's prime minister and economy minister. Keldebekov, he was Bakiev's head of t tax and social fund. And if you look at other people who are heads of parties, Felix Kulov, Babanov, they're also from the... Uh, Felix Kulov was Kyrgyzstan's first vice president, 1991. Babanov was deputy prime minister in 2008, I think. And so we see the same people, just changing places, yeah? <coughs> uh, and that's what we've been ha ha having for the past 20 years. Flying in circles, eagles. So it also we can look at the photos, yeah? People from the 2005 revolution, who were the heroes? Bek Nazarov, Otumbayeva, Bakiev. Heroes from the 2010 revolution? Bek Nazarov, Otumbayeva, Atambayev. So we see that it's the same people. <laughs> it's a, it's a, can we call it a revolution? Same people they taking over power. And if, and we, we joke, yeah, why Ot Al Bek Nazarov, hasn't changed his clothes. <laughs> Five years. <laughs> Absolutely the same. No difference. Okay, and look at, let's look at Rosa Tumbaeva. Has it been changed? If you look at her, her past, she did her PhD in, on communist theory, critical falsification of Marxist Leninist dialectic by philosophers of Frankfurt School. Then she was the Soviet Union's ambassador to UNESCO. Then she was Akai's first Minister of Foreign Affairs. She was Bakir's first minister, minister of Foreign Affairs. Then she became herself number one. And so we see progression, yeah? Whatever regime it takes, I think she's always on the top. Uh, Soviet times, Kyrgyz times. And so have, uh, there has been no leadership change, no political change. Has there been economic change? I think no. 
the Prime Minister has no economic vision. He has not released it. Uh, had there, and there have been no re reforms accomplished in the past six months. The biggest accomplishments that he might say is teachers' salaries have been increased three times. Now it's uh, average, on average, $250. And then Kyrgyzstan intends to join the customs union. And then Kyrgyzstan intends to cut the number of ministries from 20 to 17. But uh, I think all of these are disastrous. Why? Uh, because because if you look at Kyrgyzstan's GDP, not very big, just 5.5 5 billion dollars. Biggest sector is agriculture, trade, and mining. And the current policy is badly affecting the economy overall. Because, first of all, we still have fuel, fuel troubles from Russia. In 2010, it started during Bakiev time. Uh, there was an export ta tax on fuel exports to Kyrgyzstan by Russia. Uh, supposedly, early this year, this ended, but then we still have quotas. In Bishkek, you cannot buy uh, diesel more than 20 liters. So this is bad for the overall for the economy. Prices are rising for fuels. And this is especially bad for the agriculture. Uh, village heads are coming to Bishkek and asking for fuel because they cannot I sow their harvest. The com combines are not working because of the quota. The, uh, and we get 80% of our fuel from Russia. So uh, overall the economy is in trouble, the agriculture is in trouble. Also, our traders are in trouble. Kyrgyzstan is a trading country, yeah? We are the, uh, the, I think, like, a, like the Dubai of Central Asia. We, we transit center for Chinese goods. But uh, the start of the customs union has de devastated Dordoy Bazaar. Dordo Bazaar is the largest bazaar in Central Asia. 60,000 people employed directly. So if uh, indirectly, this might this is about 150, 200,000 people affected. And uh, so Dordo Bazaar is at risk. Also, uh, the other the country's other major bazaar, Karasu Bazaar, is also has been devastated because the Kyrgyz-Uzbek border has been closed since April 8, 2010. And the country's leadership has not addressed this problem, and the country's south is badly affected by this. So it's not just the Karasu Bazaar, it's the whole population of the South badly affected by this. Officially it's closed, but unofficially there's lots of contraband. So, and, and the worst, one of the worst things I think is the budget deficit. Uh, officially budget deficit is 30%. Uh, on top of that, I think we have to also take into account the transfer payments to Kyrgyz government, account for 16%. So tax and non-tax collections by the Kyrgyz government only account for 50% of the budget, 54. I think this is uh, awful. In 2011, s see, the, see the growth of the Kyrgyzstan's budget? The budget deficit in 2011 is bigger than the budget, the whole budget in 2006. Uh, so this is, I think, awful economic policy. This will crash us. And unsustainable, of course. So. So we see that I think uh, econ politics has not changed much, economy has not changed much. So what scenarios do we can we await from Kyrgyzstan? I think in politics, uh, in this scenario, it'll continue. Same eagles flying in circles. Atambayev becomes president, cool of prime minister, or somebody, th something else. Doesn't matter. Nothing changes. Uh, in economics, economics, the co economy will keep dying uh, because because uh, Russia will continue pestering Kyrgyzstan. As long as the U.S. base remains, uh, this will be, and primarily how they will do it is by fuel supplies, limiting it. Also, joining customs union will absolutely devastate Kyrgyzstan bazaars and the also the overall population because everything in Kyrgyzstan is Chinese made, like everywhere else. So it means we have to start buying Russian goods or like Russian cars and, and this is very expensive because they're not competitive in that quality. And uh, also, I, th I think there will be an upheaval in southern Kyrgyzstan because of the closed Uzbek border, um, because the situation is only helping uh, mafia bosses or, or uh, uh, organized crime. And I like because, and I, I think the saying is very relevant: if goods goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. And I think that's why Kyrgyzstan government should address this problem as soon as possible. Okay, and. As, as such, I don't think Kyrgyzstan is a stable partner for the U.S. because current leaders are no friends of the U.S. As we see, Otumbayev herself has written her dissertation in the Soviet something, and uh, Atambayev and others have 
R supposedly they have business ties to Russia and Kazakhstan. That's why they fly so much to Moscow all the time. And it, it's, uh, therefore, since they're uh, more friendly to Russia and Kazakhstan, I think uh, they're not there to reform the country. They're not there to improve the country's living standards. So they will have uh, no economic reforms. If we have no re economic reforms, we'll have social political turmoil. And that's why we had 2005 revolution, we had 2010 revolution, and this will happen again. The other scenario, I think, is that uh, if the US and others support new generation of Kyrgyz people, of youth, uh, and also the and uh, they will implement hardcore and popular reforms. Reforms are not popular, yeah? We need on, uh, only young people will implement them. Uh, new generation will implement them. Uh, they will start with, I think, reforms of Ministry of Internal Affairs. I think this is the first reform that Kyrgyzstan has to do. Why the pro problem with ethnic Uzbeks is happening is because the Ministry of Internal Affairs is, is, not, is corrupt. And they pester not only Uzbeks, but also Kyrgyz people very badly. And also in economics, we need the shock therapy. And I like the saying of Georgian reformer, Kachen Bindukize, privatize everything except the soul. And we need to deregulate, re liberalize the whole economy. And also, uh, um, how this can be reflected in policy-wise, yeah? Uh, uh, we have a university, American University of Central Asia. It's very good. They pre prepare Kyrgyzstan's current elite. Uh, they are rising up. It's a very good university. Uh, and also, we have uh, USS. It's a private university, uh, and we need, we need more of them. But it's just small. Only 1,200 students study there. Uh, another good program is uh, FLEX. It's by the State Department, also Muskie. They prepare high school, undergrad, and grad students. Uh, we need more of them. We also have, I think we need more Peace Corps volunteers in Kyrgyzstan. They are very inspiring to people in the areas where they visit. Also, we need lots of work and travel. People, I don't know if you know them, they come to the U.S. to work in the summer. It's a very good program. We need thousands of them. And also, we need more tourists and work visas and green cards to Kyrgyzstan. For example, you look at, we have one million people in Russia. That's why Russia has big influence in Kyrgyzstan. Well, and who they send home 1.2 billion dollars. Well, how many Kyrgyz are in the U.S.? Maybe a thousand, a couple of thousand. Yeah, this is no, no match for Russia. And only 900, 196 lottery, lottery green cards given to Kyrgyz in 2011. We need more. If I think it's strengthening Kyrgyzstan uh, U.S. ties. And also we need, I think, English language channels to Kyrgyzstan. Currently, of the top three voice channels, ORTE and TV are second and third. Okay. So, my my points were I was trying to make that Kyrgyzstan's leadership economically and politically are flying in circles, nothing new happening, and therefore they are flip-flop partner for the U.S. And if the U.S. wants a reliable partner, they should support a new generation, and they'll be a st stable partner. Thank you. Okay. Our fourth speaker is my colleague Seth Krups. Uh, thank you, Seth. Uh, our fourth speaker is my colleague Seth Kropsey. He is a senior fellow here at Hudson. He served as a naval officer from 1985 to 2004, and as deputy undersecretary of the Navy in the Reagan and George H. W. Bush administrations. Uh, he uh, is a specialist on logistics and low-intensity conflict, and he will try to put uh, what we've heard in, uh, in context in terms of the interests of the United States and the United States military. Seth? Thank you, David. Yeah, Hudson again, welcome to everybody. Uh, I'd uh, like to address three aspects of the role that Kyrgyzstan <coughs> plays in our military efforts in Afghanistan today. First, I'd like to discuss is the significance of the U.S. Air Force base at Manas. The recent instability in this country notwithstanding, the transit center at Manas arguably provides the most efficient uh, and cost-effective and secure way to transport troops, 
uh, and military supplies mm. and also to provide medical services to uh, our personnel, military personnel. I'd also like to address how the success of coalition efforts in Afghanistan affects Kyrgyzstan and also the larger Central Asian region. Our efforts in Afghanistan over the past decade have reduced the volatility and greater risks presented by militant Islamic fundamentalists in the region. Reduced, I said, not eliminated. In particular, the coalition's efforts have significantly reduced the will and uh, the capability of the region's most dangerous Islamic terror groups, like the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, the IMU. Um, third, I want to talk about the significance of our presence in Kyrgyzstan and Central Asia as a whole to the coalition's success in Afghanistan. The United States has provided training and logistical support to governments in the region to fight terrorism and also uh, transnational crime. This, uh, combined with the presence of our troops, has arguably denied the Taliban a safe haven on their northern border where they could regroup and fight again. The political situation in Central Asia need only be compared with that in Pakistan in order to illustrate a simple point, and that is that our efforts in the region are essential to efforts against the Taliban. The transit center in Kyrgyzstan provides the most efficient means of transporting uh, troops, munitions, medical supplies, and assistance into Afghanistan. Kyrgyzstan's closeness to Afghanistan, combined with its airborne capabilities, makes it more efficient than uh, several other alternatives. Kyrgyzstan's uh, proximity to Afghanistan also makes it the best choice for transferring operations at Manas to a base in Turkey or Iraq. Uh, it's better than those alternatives. Because of its airborne capabilities, Manas is preferable to alternative land-based routes across the Eurasian continent. Uh, according to our own Congressional Research Service, the Pentagon, however, does have other options. It has the option of moving uh, the same kind of logistic material support by rail from Riga through Russia and Central Asia. Another option involves moving materials by ship from Georgia across the Caspian to a combination of transportation uh, through railheads and then trucks across Central Asia. Uh, it's clear that Manas is the more efficient alternative to these options because it supports our operations in Afghanistan from the air. It's equally clear that there are other options. The use of the base is arguably the most cost-effective <coughs> way. The distance between Afghanistan and Iraq or Turkey would inevitably require a much greater budget uh, for everything, from fuel onwards. Uh, take it for granted that the Kyrgyz government uh, does charge $60 million a year for the use of the base. Um, 
which some of you might find uh, a large amount of money, perhaps shocking. However, because it represents a threefold increase from what the Kyrgyz government charged um, in 2009. Um, so uh, it's a large amount of money, but uh, there is value gained for it. The recent behavior of the Kyrgyz government uh, necessarily raises the question about whether they will continue to increase the price. Um, I think that's unlikely. But I wouldn't rule it out. It's unlikely provided that the, the government understands that we do have other options. Um, if they insist on making the use of the base uh, financially as well as, and I underscore that, as well as politically infeasible. This could change, however, if we give the Kyrgyz government the impression that we will uh, soon be ending our operations in Afghanistan and that that will happen um, in a hurry. Despite uh, Kyrgyzstan's recent ethnic unrest, it does offer one of the most secure routes into Afghanistan. Look at a map. The only other alternative routes that I have not mentioned, of course, go through Pakistan. The security risks that moving the operations that are currently run in Kyrgyzstan to Pakistan require uh, little imagination. Um, they're large. Given Pakistan's political instability, uh, the current atmosphere of growing mistrust between our governments, between the government of the United States and the government of Pakistan, uh, and the widely known presence of those who are hostile to the United States and the coalition fighting in Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan is clearly the safer, the safer option. I'd like to say something also about the effect of the war in Afghanistan uh, on Central Asia security. The fight against the Taliban has had a positive impact on Central Asia's regional security. It's most evident in the reduced threat that I mentioned a moment ago of the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan as a result of coalition efforts. The IMU established itself primarily to overthrow uh, Islam Karimov's government in order to establish uh, an Islamic theocracy based on Sharia law. The organization also became uh, famous, even notorious, for the role that it played in Tajikistan's civil war in the 1990s. When the U.S. began military operations in Afghanistan in 2002, the IMU directed its efforts against the coalition and it sided with the Taliban. This resulted in the deaths of hundreds of militants, the elimination of their founding leader, and the shift of most of their activity to Pakistan. While elements of the IMU continue to operate in Central Asia, their influence, uh, their extent of their capabilities, um, their ability to shape events has been substantially reduced. Combined with the efforts of the United States to provide training and support to these governments to fight against extremism, uh, terrorism, and to cut the level of flow of drugs, Central Asia is less susceptible to the rise of a rogue state. 
Finally, uh, I'd like to address the likelihood that our Central Asian presence and the security that comes with it is only contributing to our success against the Taliban so far. Our presence in Central Asia and the commitment to assisting these governments to fight against terrorism and transnational crime has most likely prevented these governments from becoming a safe haven safe haven for Taliban fighters. All you have to do is look at the way that the Taliban frustrates our military efforts through its exploitation of Afghanistan's southern border with Pakistan uh, to get an idea of the kind of tactical liability that Central Asia could become. So U.S. involvement in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan is effectively denying the Taliban another base from which they can stage attacks against coalition forces. And I think that pretty much sums up uh, the United States military's involvement, interest, engagement in that part of the region, in that part of the world, um, and uh, how our efforts uh, in Central Asia are contributing to greater security um, such as it is uh, at the moment today. And thank you for your attention. Well, th <clears throat> thanks to all of our speakers. I'd like to add a few uh, brief observations of my own uh, before we go uh, to questions. I'm sure all of, uh, many of you do have questions for our speakers, and we do have time for that. One, one uh, striking fact about the Bakiyev regime is that uh, when it came into power in 2005, it was considered uh, the, uh, uh, a very liberal regime. In fact, the, the revolution which brought Bakiyev into power was called the Tulip Revolution which was uh, another way of saying that it offered hope and that it represented the aspirations of the people, only to degenerate into uh, a one-man and one-family dictatorship. The other uh, observation that I have based on, in part on my experience with Russia, is that Russia in relation to Kyrgyzstan is in a very, very uh, tricky situation. On the one hand, strategically, Russia doesn't want a victorious Taliban uh, influencing events in Central Asia. Uh, certainly the countries of Central Asia, including uh, Kyrgyzstan, are no match militarily for the Taliban, which is battle-hardened and, and dedicated and infused with a, an extremist ideology. I was told that the uh, Kyrgyz uh, army is, le is even, uh, <coughs> consists of 10,000 soldiers, uh, most of whom don't show up. And under these circumstances, it would seem that Russia has every reason to encourage a, uh, Kyrgyzstan to, to welcome the United States presence, but this has not been the case. Russian propaganda and uh, the Russian media have consistently uh, agitated against the base and against the American presence there. And it's quite possible that under any circumstances what Russia wants is, even if they're ready to tolerate an American base, to have some control over it. In any case, uh, I will now uh, take uh, questions for our panelists. Is there anyone? And we have uh, we have a microphone which we can bring to you. Uh, who would like to ask the? Yes, please. This gentleman. Yeah. This gentleman here. You, you'd like. Thank you. Uh, Chen. Freelance correspondent. 
Bethesda Mountain. My question would be uh, for Sitepek Usmanov. How could the people in power, how could uh, uh, people, uh, how do I say? Uh, people in power, no, no, before revolution and after revolution, revolution, the people in power are the same. Thank you. Uh, do you want, y y your question is, why is it that they're the same? Yeah. Why are they the same? Why is it that the people before and after are s the revolution are, this are, are the same people? Uh, good question. <laughs> um, I think on the, on the other, one hand, uh, people Many people trust them, and and the the regimes over the past twenty years have not allo allowed for new people to come to come forth. They just uh, pick from their own people. So, th in the public face, the same people are well known. Therefore, it's, it's easiest for them from their own people to come forward and gain public support. Does it make sense? And I, uh, yeah. that's what I think. Let me let me let me add a couple of words. Uh, in fact, it's true. And uh, let me continue in uh, uh, Russian, okay? Please use your uh, translator device. Okay, thank you. And sorry for that. Ситуация, дело в том, что склад такая. Очень хорошо было подмечено. Власть меняется, но изменений во властных группировок не происходит. Те люди, которые, в принципе, были представлены на фотографии, которые а сейчас находятся у власти и около власти, это, как правило, а те люди, которые представляют интересы разных элитных группировок во власти. И в этой связи, независимо от того, что, какие происходят изменения, а первым индикатором того, что а, идет смена власти, но не меняются люди, как раз-таки вот представлены эти фотографии. Есть такая хорошая шутка, помните, да? А, Талиран еще в 18 веке а, сказал, что Меняется правительство, новое правительство, но старые министры. Да? И вот такая ситуация как раз и происходит в Кыргызстане сейчас. И вот э, то, что мы видим, то, что происходит, она создает впечатление того, что ничего не меняется да, в стране. И вот, как я говорил в своем выступлении, э, это происходит из-за того, что власть у нас сращена с крупным капиталом. И э, в этой связи ожидать, что кардинально что-то изменится в течение 6-7 месяцев не приходится. А, ведь фактически, если мы будем смотреть, что а, календарно прошел год да, с апрельских событий 2010 года, которые а, привели к тому, что президент Бакиев покинул страну. Но фактически а, нынешняя система государственной власти и государственного управления в Кыргызстане у нас существует не более чем 5 месяцев. То есть парламент он сформировался э, в декабре прошлого года. Выборы прошли в октябре прошлого года. Реально приступили а, к работе и к новой системе взаимоотношений, начиная с конца января. А, и поэтому, да, лица те же самые. И, в принципе, я тоже об этом говорил, о том, что даже депутаты парламента, избранные в октябре прошлого года, они, если даже кто-то новый лиц, но они представляют сегменты тех же самых элитных группировок. Вот, вот в этом как раз-таки заключается проблемная зона для Кыргызстана. Если мы хотим действительно модернизацию, а не обогащение бюрократов, тогда надо предпринимать иные меры, которые разрабатывают и используются сейчас, в том числе и здесь, в Вашингтоне. Спасибо. I represent Johns Hopkins University. I'm from Kyrgyzstan. And I wanted to introduce a little correction to your uh, conversation about Russia and Russia's role uh, with the base. The thing is, the Russian government has never been against the base per se. The Russian officials who were divided into uh, the Siloviki faction and then the Siviliki faction, they all agreed that the base played a key role in, secure, in uh, ensuring security. What they disagreed or what they opposed was the U.S. government's unwillingness to talk with the Russians directly, 
and set a clear timetable for the withdrawal of the base. That's what really pissed them off. And another thing that really made them livid over the past 10 years was the fact that the minor corporation and a few other Kyrgyz fuel suppliers, they have been uh, basically uh, fooling the Russians. They were buying Russian fuel at very reduced prices because of the agreement between the Kyrgyz government and the Russia, and they were selling it to the U.S. base at a uh, ripped up price. And the Russians, they were basically told lies. So this was what really made the Russians live it. And I think that what we're seeing today is that Russia and officials there, they want to play a direct role in supplying fuel to the base because it's, it doesn't make sense. It was everything, fuel was coming from Russia. So this is just a correction. Thank you. Uh, Seth, do you, do, do you have any th thoughts about that? Uh, or Sharadil, you yeah, wanted to say something. Uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> And I will call again <laughs> yes, this again, translation. Again, we'll have to uh, <laughs> good use, exercises. Use uh, the services of our translators. Здесь действительно был затронут интересный момент, но здесь есть одно большое большое заблуждение. Дело в том, что в последнее время, ну мы тоже вот отслеживаем ситуацию по мини корпе вообще все, что связано с Кыргызстаном. И я могу сказать, что Авиационное топливо в России в последнее время не закупается. И поставки, которые осуществляются в транзитный центр, а Минокорп, это не идут поставки из Российской Федерации или произведенных на нефть, ну, скажем, нефтеперерабатывающих заводах на территории Российской Федерации. И а, в этой связи надо заметить, опять же, что а, логистика, я просто здесь я вот возвращаюсь опять к тому, что Сет говорил, Кыргызстанская база, она важна не только тем, что это опорная точка для борьбы. Это единственная база, которая позволяет Соединенным Штатам иметь двустороннюю дорогу. Более 80% тех товаров, ну скажем, продукции, которая необходима для поддержания войск антитеррористической коалиции в Афганистане, она идет наземным путем и конкретно через границу Таджики, э, Узбекистана и с Северным Афганистаном порядка 80%. Но эта дорога односторонняя. Все товары, которые поставляются в Афганистан, там и остаются. Ничего не идет из Афганистана. И воздушный путь, который находится в Бычкеке, это вот как уже э, Сет говорил о том, что туда э, э, переправляются военнослужащие армии США, да? Из США в Афганистан и из Афганистана домой обратно в США. При этом, а, если вы знаете, по всем этим маршрутам, которые проходят через, а, ну, знаете, да, вот первый маршрут, который проходит, это идет через три Балтийских порта, потом далее через Беларусь, Россию, все дальше идет, идет через Казахстан, и все это идет через Узбекистан. Так вот, по всем этим территориям запрещен провоз оружия. А та база, которая находится в Кыргызстане, она позволяет военнослужащим иметь при себе личное оружие. То есть пистолеты, автоматы, пулеметы, гранатометы и так далее. Да? И вот, вот это как раз таки подчеркнуть, насколько эта база важна. Ну и плюс, вот возвращаясь к тому вопросу, а, о том, что вот, все основано на том, что а, происходит, что Россия недовольна тем, что а, реактивное топливо перепродается. Да? Ну вот это же смешно, да, что а, было бы смешно, если бы не такой факт. А как можно было бы закрывать глаза на то, что а гражданская авиация, да, она Кыргызстана, все самолеты, которые прилетают, улетают, не только Кыргызстанск, но и международный, да, потреб, может потребить так много горючего. Да. И а, получается, что в принципе в этом была и заинтересованность и российской стороны, да, когда что большое количество, в то время, когда поставлялось реактивное топливо на авиабазу, ну будем ее называть авиабазой, да, а, будет предназначено для нужд гражданской авиации. То есть это настолько очевидно, что это ну, в разы превышает потребности всех самолетов гражданской авиации, которые осуществляют рейсы в и из а, Бишкека и по а, территории Кыргызстана. И вот в этой связи еще а, хочу просто усилить эту аргументацию тем, что а, авиабманас, авиабаза Манас, она служит ну, большой заправочной станцией для самолетов, ВВС США, осуществляющих патрулирование в небе Афганистана. То есть несколько топливозаправщиков взлетают из 
Манаса и в воздухе до заправляют истребители. Да? То есть, опять же, это речь не о том, чтобы заправить просто транспортный самолет. Речь идет о том, что производится до заправка самолетов. И вы представляете, какое это количество а, горючего идет. Вот. И вот в этой связи, мне кажется, все-таки это не совсем а, соответствует реальности а, то мнение, которое сложилось на сегодняшний день относительно позиции России в, а, по отношению к а, за, а, поставкам авиационного керосина на территорию Кыргызской республики. Yes, this gentleman. Like very, Please you know, identify uh, yourself, by the I'm way. I'm Randall Doyle. I'm State Department, and I, mean, I work um, in the, the Department, the Bureau of Human Rights, uh, Democracy, and Labor. Okay. Well. Uh, it's very two quick questions. Number one to Ms. Lanskoy. Uh, you were talking about the, the slow but steady development in democracy in Kyrgyzstan and so forth. But in your opinion, how much does the Russian and U.S. involvement in the country, for various reasons, their own interests, uh, debilitating or hindering uh, democracy? And the second quick question is, with the emergence of China, uh, I assume Central Asia, much like South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Northeast Asia, will eventually be drawn into the Chinese uh, sphere of influence, especially economically. And with the development of Xinjiang province, um, I'm starting to wonder, uh, in essence, once the Chinese interests get involved, how is that dynamic going to change uh, Kyrgyzstan, the U.S. base there, and the Russian interests in that country as well? Um, okay. Um In terms of um, uh, kind of foreign influence, I think it cuts in a number of different ways. Um, it's already David had mentioned, um, and, and Sherry Deal in his presentation had mentioned, um, Russian um, a suspicion of Kyrgyzstan that uh, there were there were statements, uh, for, for instance, from Medvedev during the revolution where he was saying that it's not really a viable state. He was feeding into this whole um, idea that Kyrgyzstan can't survive. They, these were um very overblown statements that came from the russians um i think they're having um they're kind of boomeranging because um people kyrgyz people saw themselves portrayed in an extremely negative light by russian media um and i think russian prestige over the last year has declined Um, Kyrgyzstan was a little bit different from a lot of other post-Soviet <coughs> countries. Um, so, for instance, going there, 2005-2006, they s tended to see Russia as a natural partner, a natural leader, tended to look up to Russia. I think the portrayal of the revolution and some of the comments coming from the Russian leaders have um, offended and frightened and, and driven people away. Um, Russia remains, and of course, of course, um, not helping Atambayeva at the moment when she asked for help. I think one of, um, in, so in, 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 in uh, June 2010, at the height of the conflict, um, Atambayeva had asked uh, for Russian help and was, was basically refused. And it looked, um, one of the possible explanations for that is that they had hoped that her government would simply collapse. Um, The, the uh, U.S. influence um, has, has shifted at different times. Uh, there were times when um, U.S. interests were, um, when the U.S. was more clearly articulating an interest in democracy and other, depending on uh, ambassador and depending on where things stood with the base, there, there have been different um, tendencies over the years. But I think overall, the United States has been by far more consistent Um, in um, kind of encouraging Kyrgyzstan to reform and, 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 and looking for uh, more democratic uh, uh, processes. China has been um, relatively, I would say, uh, neutral on questions of democracy. I mean, um, the whole, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is going to be opposed to seeing real reform in Kyrgyzstan, but they, it's a model that threatens them. Overall, China, I, I believe, is mostly, it, it mostly is pursuing economic interests, is pursuing trade, and um, um, has not, in an overt way, tried to influence the, the politics. Sure. Если позволите, да, я тоже добавлю. Yep, sorry again. <laughs> you have to. Yeah, please use your devices. Uh, дело в том, что, когда мы говорим о взаимоотношениях uh, Кыргызстана и Соединенных Штатов Америки, надо а сделать такой акцент, что в принципе США и Кыргызстан сотрудничают только в рамках региональных программ и интересов США. 
поясняю, почему это. Дело в том, что на отношения между США и Кыргызстаном не сказывается отношения США с Китаем, США с Таджикистаном, США с Узбекистаном, США с Казахстаном. Соответственно, как бы такой единой программы нет, да, развить. Второй момент. Когда мы говорим, опять же, отношения между США и Кыргызстаном, надо всегда иметь в виду, что на политической элиту Кыргызстана большое влияние оказывает два факта. Первый. Несмотря на то, что 20 лет тому назад прекратил существование Советский Союз, но эти подходы, они до сих пор живы. И особенно вот отсюда следует второй момент. Да? То, что Кыргызстан находится в информационном пространстве России. Вот почему наш коллега сидит от, об этом и говорил, да? что порядка а, то, самые топовые а, телекомпании это российские. Общественно российское телевидение, российское телевидение, РТР, ОРТ и так далее. Да? И соответственно те отношения, которые а, Россия выстраивает в США, оно транслируется кыргызстанским политикам. Это вольно или невольно? А, ну, скажем так, я не скажу, что является определяющим, но формирует определенное мнение в, по, по отношению к США. Это вот такой есть нюанс. Еще одно наблюдение. Мириам очень хорошо заметила то, что Китай, в принципе, соблюдал нейтралитет, но до 15 июня. То есть до даты, когда был проведен саммит глав государств Шанхайской организации сотрудничества. Туда входит Китай в том числе. И вот после всех вот этих а встречи и консультации, которые проводились, а, ну, пришлось встречаться с одним-двумя представителями Китая, и они говорили о том, что, наверное, они будут а, более активными а, в Центральной Азии в рамках ШОС и в рамках других многосторонних организаций. Спасибо. Yes, my name is Muhtar Jumalif. I'm the ambassador of Kyrgyzstan. I'd like, first of all, welcome my, com my compatriots from Kyrgyzstan uh, for the presentations. Excellent presentations, very interesting. Just uh, briefly to comment to Mr. Saidbek, I think what's happening in Kyrgyzstan and all the reforms happening in Kyrgyzstan is, uh, of course, related to what you uh, actually presented in your uh, uh, slides, uh, saying cycling these uh, eagles around uh, changing the same politicians. I think uh, what the uh, speakers of, uh, and of the international community has recognized that Kyrgyzstan uh, moved forward with their reforms and uh, the president uh, committed uh, to leave her post after they will uh, finish with these uh, political reforms and I think this will be the first precedent in this uh, cycle so she will cut this cycle and uh, all the uh, other politicians will have the same chance uh, as others to participate in this free open election process and that uh, referendum uh, and uh, uh, election to the parliament which held in Kyrgyzstan uh, I worked also closely with Sheradal at that time yeah. so uh, I think uh, it was international tough time <laughs> yeah international community accept it was open fair and uh, even first time uh, was uh, such a Uh, transparent elections held in uh, in our region. I hope that uh, this year, so uh, the Kyrgyzstan will have new chance, uh, except, uh, historical chance, to move forward with their reforms. And uh, I think we should work uh, together. Uh, regard to the friends in United States, uh, I see how many interests uh, today in this room we have uh, from the United States. I think that these all are friends the Ki of Kyrgyzstan, not enemies. And uh, this uh, France is growing, so we had political relations with the United States. At an uh, actual visit of our president to the United States, and we have a number of uh, very priority agenda in our, uh, in our political relations with the United States, and the United States, uh, we are proud of actually of 20 years of our bilateral relations with America, and we believe that we can do more for both of the countries in terms of the building democracy and for the global security and we are proud that Kyrgyzstan is a one of the one of the partner in this uh, in this area my uh, small question to Sheridil uh, 
so <coughs> Kyrgyzstan is one of the uh, member to all the w one of the active member to the international organization. You were saying also in your presentation that the political, uh, the politicians and private sector is always uh, strongly related. So this makes problem uh, in uh, and that most of the problems it's bind with this. So Kyrgyzstan is a member to the international organization. So we are member to the number of human rights uh, uh, human rights uh, agreements and. Uh, we are the also member to the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. What do you think how this organization or international organization can uh, play a role in terms of the preventing such a kind of difficulties or warning or predicting such a difficult situation? Because we are committed, so we work with several programs of IMF, World Bank, uh, WTO, then UN. So uh, at Kyrgyzstan uh, as a uh, we are actually accepting all the proposals that that is good so mm -hmm. and I think so what we have today I think this is the one of the results that we are building the democratic society in Kyrgyzstan so that the existing situation in Kyrgyzstan cannot accept for example the corruption mm -hmm. so then uh, if there will be the corruption and this binding situation with the private sector with the uh, civil servants so then then it's uh, uh, and this goes to the revolution so what do you think? I, I, I want to know what is your position in this yeah. regard. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your question. And again, let me continue in Russian. <laughs> again. <laughs> да, again. А, мне хотелось поделиться сначала с одним наблюдением. А, когда дело касается взаимоотношений между представителями США и Кыргызстана, а, у меня, например, создается такое впечатление, когда речь идет о привлечении инвестиций или каких-то программ помощи, а, Большинство это все-таки лоббируется интересами каких-то элитных группировок. То есть целенаправленной такой структурированной политики, которая продвигала бы интересы, национальные интересы страны, пока нет. Вот. Есть понимание, это а, второе наблюдение. А, у нас в стране есть понимание того, что а, американцы игля, играют ключевую роль во многих международных организациях. Это и Всемирный банк, Международный валютный фонд. Организация Объединенных Наций и, наверное, странно прозвучит, Азиатский банк развития. Да? США является одним из крупных э, участников Азиатского банка развития в том числе. И а дальше, к сожалению, этого понимания работы не идет. То есть, э, у нас, э, Кыргызстан, у нас нет лоббистских компаний в США, на территории США и в этих международных организациях, тем, чтобы они лоббировали, продвигали интересы. Речь не идет о том, чтобы иметь какие-то группы людей, речь идет о том, чтобы иметь интересы, которые а, представляли бы и соответствовали тем потребностям, которые испытывает страна сегодня. Это вот, ну, что касается деятельности организации. И а, в этой связи, мне кажется, вот, проведение подобных мероприятий, оно все-таки должно а, повысить а, и информированность и вместе с тем определить реальные точки сотрудничества и реальные проблемы, которые стоят. Мы можем говорить много о проведении институциональных реформ. Мы с господином послом проработали вместе в очень тяжелое время для страны. Это апрель прошлого года, ну и я потом покинул администрацию президента в ноябре прошлого года, получив другой контракт. Но я работал там же в администрации президента, это первого президента Акаева, 2002-2004 годы. То есть институциональные реформы, они идут всегда, все время. Реформы системы управления, антикоррупционное законодательство. И вот в этой связи я должен отметить, что законодательство Кыргызстана намного лучше и продвинутое, чем законодательство Узбекистана, Казахстана. Да? А в области регулирования разных отношений, в том числе экономических. Вот. Но, понимаете, проблема не в том, чтобы выстраивать какие-то структуры да, или рисовать новую структуру состава министерств ведомств, да, определять какие-то отношения между бизнесом и так далее. Сейчас основная ключевая проблема, я об этом я вот пытался как раз говорить, то, что она до сих пор не решена. Это опять же сращивание интересов крупного бизнеса с а, а, крупными чиновниками. Речь не обязательно о политиках. Речь идет о тех людях, которые в принципе находятся на уровне и заместители министров, начальника департаментов, управлений. Да? И вот, вот это она как раз таки система, она до сих пор имеет место быть. И а, со, люди это понимают и создается альтернативная система, можно сказать, управления. Рядовой гражданин предпочтет обратиться за помощью к криминальному авторитету, а не к, мили, а не к начальнику а, отдела милиции. Да? Когда речь заходит о том, чтобы, ну, например, а, 
кто-то занял у него там, скажем, ну, 5000 долларов, да, и не возвращает. Попробуй через судебные станции вернуть этот долг. Вот. Она затянется на годы. Вот. А через криминальный авторитет, отдав, скажем, 10-40% суммы, эти деньги вернут через 3-4 дня. То есть создается более эффективная система управления. Да, она противозаконна, противоправна. Да, она служит э, источником роста криминала и так далее. Вот. И вот Сид тоже как раз говорил о том, что закрыта, например, граница с Узбекистаном. Да? Вот. 80% овощей и фруктов, которые продаются на рынках Бишкека, это из Узбекистана. Как это может быть? Да? Граница закрыта, а овощи и фрукты из Узбекистана приходят. Контрабанда. Это контрабанда. Несмотря на то, что с двух сторон стоят пограничники, таможенные структуры и так далее. Да? 80%. Это очень большая цифра. Это, если вы примерно карту знаете, это надо проехать с юга Кыргызстана, подняться вверх. Вот. Это, это действительно большая территория. Вот. И, в принципе, все это проходит. Мало пересечь границу, надо еще доставить, подходить документы происхождения, а сертификаты и так далее. И, опять же, видите, если государственные структуры не работают, то более эффективно начинает работать не государственные структуры, неформальные отношения. Вот, вот это как раз-таки та проблема, с которой мы сейчас сталкиваемся. И а, я думаю, как раз, если мы будем еще чаще встречаться, наверное, мы можем как раз найти пути наиболее эффективного решения реальных проблем. Да? Вот. Безусловно, надо работать по ним. Но, наверное, сейчас уже настало а, время, когда надо а, действительно повернуться лицом к тем а, реальным проблемам, которые существуют, и все-таки смотреть на Кыргызстан и немного по-другому. Да? Спасибо. Uh, well, we have a... yes, this slide. We want to get the microphone to you. Where, ah, where is our microphone? Okay. Thank you. Marie Terrell, I'm an analyst in charge of Iran and Central Asia at the Strategic Studies section at CENTCOM. I'm sorry, can you repeat uh, your affiliation? Strategic Studies section, CENTCOM. Central oh. Plan. All right. POD. Okay. Um, This question is, again, back to the China, role of China. Um, as you know, in, in the Shanghai, recent Shanghai Cooperation Organization, both Mr. Medvedev and uh, Hu Jintao expressed that they have an intention, as soon as you know, we, we're gradual leaving, U.S. leaving Afghanistan, they're going to play a major role in, in Afghanistan. Now, I have listened to a lot of uh, interviews by your students, particularly American University in Central Asia, uh, in, in, you know, Central Asia University. Make sure that you're speaking into the mic because you're... Uh, yeah. I don't know whether it's... Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of sentiment, uh, sympathy, sympathy shown by students, particularly young people, toward, cent uh, toward China as a model or alternative. Uh, in your uh, opinion, Uh, can you tell us how the Kyrgyz people in general feel about China and also uh, how your government would uh, be able in the future to balance the China-Russia uh, relations? Is there any potential? Thank you. Should I answer? Yeah. <coughs> as, as for China, Kyrgyz people fear China. Uh, they, they fear that China people, Chinese people come and everybody will become Chinese in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, it's a reality, yeah. It's, and uh, although China, I think, is the U Kyrgyzstan's best friend, during April 7 revolution last year, they didn't close the border like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan did. They remained open, and also because because of China's cheap goods, we have the Dordoi Karasu bazaars, where uh, many people, the biggest source of employment in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, this is unfortunate, and uh, according to recent survey by the IRI. Uh, Uh, when there was a question, how many, how do you like China as a partner of Kyrgyzstan? Uh, Russia get got 90% approval rate. China, I think, had about five five percent. It's very low, unfortunately. Um, as as for your second part of the question is how. Well, 
I don't think Kyrgyzstan can play a balancing role. I think Kyrgyzstan just like cannot play one against the other. Just, we just have to be an open country, neutral like Switzerland, and be friends with all, trade with all, and open, open, be open to business. I don't think we can play give favors to anybody. We have to be equal to all. Okay, uh, Kathy Kosman. Um Hi, Kathy Kosman, uh, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. I'll ask my inevitable question, and that has to do with, uh, in 2009, the Kyrgyz government under Bakiev passed a very repressive religion law, uh, which, for example, uh, bans uh, or criminalizes private religious activity. Uh, uh, someone from the Kyrgyz pre current Kyrgyz presidential administration recently told me that perhaps number one uh, to um, on the post-election -ele list is to amend this religion law in accord with international standards. Uh, I wanted to ask whether others have that same impression and also to ask whether the very repressive religion laws which prevail throughout Central Asia is considered when uh, the U.S. considers uh, its anti-terrorism and anti-extremism measures and policies in Central Asia because these religion laws have the danger of radicalizing uh, much of the population of Central Asia. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> who would me, like to answer that? Uh, uh, Miriam, do you want to? Sure, why don't I start uh, and maybe others. Yeah. Um, in terms of, um, there's an incident that I actually had wanted to mention, which was the Nukat incident in, um, in Kyrgyzstan, which predates um, the ethnic conflict, and it sort of came up in a different sauce, which was the anti-extremism sauce. And it was a case when um, I think it was 32 people who were arrested ostensibly for radicalism. Um, they were not by any stretch of the... They, they were, um, if not entirely Uzbeks, mostly Uzbeks. Um, they were basically eating plov in public. It was the end of um, uh, the, the the holidays, and it was a public feast. Um, and this was in the south, and it was under Baikia, basically. So the use of, um, and they were held, uh, they were sentenced from 9 to 20 years, uh, held in atrocious uh, circumstances, uh, beaten, tortured, um, so forth, and then by the uh, released by the provisional government uh, without ever looking into how those cases came about. But that that's a case from 2008 where essentially a, the kind of abuse that you saw later in an ethnic con conte context was happening under um, a anti-radicalism uh, um, explanation. And we have to be very careful because you can see a discourse that goes, um, uh, we can't uh, do these things under the, the ethnic banner, so uh, switching to a radicalism and um, anti-extremism language when essentially similar things are happening. Um, and um, as far as revisions, and, and yes, there, there needs to be a, a more precise language um, when defining um, uh, extremism and, and radicalism throughout Central Asia, not just in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, we, we, we have about 10 minutes left, so what I would like is to get uh, several questions and then uh, perhaps our panelists could, uh, could answer them all at once. Why don't we start at this side of the, of the hall. This, this gentleman, yes. Yes, uh, my name is Aaron Beitman. I'm from the Terrorism Transnational Crime and Corruption Center. Um, one of the things that uh, all the panelists mentioned was uh, the role of organized crime. So I was hoping they could expand on that by talking about how organized crime affects politics in Kyrgyzstan and what may be done to uh, prevent that, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, impact. Can we get a couple more questions? That uh, We have a question about organized crime. Yes, this gentleman. Uh, I was going to give a lead-in remark, but since we're short of time, I'll just Just, just introduce yourself. Yes, and, I'm sorry. And John Sandrock. I'm now with the uh, company called Antelique Services, Inc. Previously, I was with the OSCE, 
Tajikistan, visited Bishkek a number of times, met uh, President Otambaeva for the first time in 1996 and several times thereafter. But I'll keep my question simple. Will Kyrgyzstan permit full and open participation by the OSCE, and particularly the Office of Democratic Institution and Human Rights, in the run-up run to the elections and during the election monitoring process? And will then that be considered, and I direct this to Mr. Osmanov in particular, will, if the OSCE certifies these elections as having been free and fair, Will that be an acceptable outcome to the young people in Kyrgyzstan? All right, and let's get one more question. Yes, this lady here. Hello, Lauren Goodrich with Strat4. Um, this is mainly for Mr. Cropsey. Um, we know that the U.S. has stepped up its anti-terror training in Kyrgyzstan and other Central Asian states. Um, I was hoping to get your opinion on if this is because of a concern in Central Asia about the Central Asians in Afghanistan coming back as soon as the U.S. is pulled out of Afghanistan, or is this uh, more about the U.S., uh, about homegrown terrorism? All right, we have three c quite Why don't we start with organized crime, and let's keep our answers short so that we can get to as many people as possible. Yeah, organized crime is a big problem in Kyrgyzstan. It's a big problem because our Ministry of Interior Affairs itself is organized crime, in, <laughs> in the opinions of many people. If, if, if you look at the survey results, how much you trust organized crime, I mean police, we, ha we had a survey, mini survey, 260 people participated, 255 said we don't trust them. Uh, and uh, that's a big problem, yeah? And organized crime can only exist if the Ministry of Interior Affairs does not work. That's why in Georgia, the first thing they did is, is reform, uh, reform Ministry of Interior Affairs. Uh, and the result of big crime in Kyrgyzstan, we have uh, many ma high influence of, of uh, mafia or organized crime on politics. Uh, and the and this was reflected, uh, for example, in this Republica party, the deputy head of the party is the uh, wife of the former head of ma ma mafia boss. Uh, and then in the uh, Atajut party, also reportedly many uh, mafia people. And uh, r most recently, on June 1st, Barack Obama signed the letter of drug king kingpins of seven people. One of them was from Kyrgyzstan. There was mostly Af Afghan. Uh, Mexico and surprisingly one Kyrgyz guy also appeared there and so that's about organized crime what what about the elections and the uh, uh, and elections and the OSCE yeah the latest elections were also deemed f very fair and uh, but they were but nothing has changed so if, if we still have fair elections but nothing changes I think nothing will change in Kyrgyzstan too and it will be bad for the people uh, Seth, do you want to uh, respond to the question addressed to you about uh, Central Asian terrorism? From yes, I do, but I'd like to hear it first. Oh, yeah. can you just repeat the, your your question for? Yeah, my question is: is that the U.S. anti-terror training that is occurring in Kyrgyzstan and other Central Asian states is this more about the Central Asians that are fighting in Afghanistan, a fear of them returning after the U.S. is pulled out of Afghanistan? Or is it more domestic, homegrown terrorism that the U.S. is worried about training up on? Uh, both. <clears throat> it's both. Um, uh, who would have imagined uh, 25 years ago or so? Or some would have, but would there have been a lot of people thinking, uh, let's say three decades ago, that um, the idea of, of a return to the caliphate um, would become a dominant force in, uh, in Islam? Um, was that what analysts were predicting? Um, I don't think so. Um, what's the future of, um, of radicalism in Central Asia? Well, doesn't look too doesn't look as though it has a very promising future right now, but who can tell what will happen in, happen in the future? Several of the questions that have and answers that have come back and forth here um, are suggesting that uh, Russia and China are will compete, um, and what role does that does that competition? How is that competition affected by um, what happens with the extension or um, continuation 
of uh, radicalism throughout areas where there are Muslims living. Um, so it's a prudent thing to train forces that are capable of combating both uh, transnational crime and terrorism, radicalism, and so on and so forth, not only for what's happening in Afghanistan and what might happen in the future, uh, but in the region as a whole. Well, we have time for just a few more questions. Uh, who would, uh, uh, yes, uh, why don't we, we get a couple more questions and then we'll have to close today's session. Um, thank you. April Eubank, Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies. Um, my question is primarily directed at um, Mr. Uzmanov, but anybody else who wants to fit in. Um, I was curious about the statement that we should be putting U.S. efforts into the Kyrgyz youth. I read an op-ed article that came out last week talking specifically about how the Kyrgyz youth may in fact be less revolutionary than many people claim, and that they are more or less a chip off the old block, so to speak, and that some of the problems that we see in the uh, current Kyrgyz government may continue in the future. What I'd like to know is, how should the U.S. Pr proceed with this? Should we be trusting in the Kyrgyz youth to revolutionize? And if so, why? All right, we'll take two more questions. This, this young lady. Hi, my name is Silvana Chen from the Human Rights Watch Asia Division. Um, three weeks ago, President El Bigdorj of Mongolia visited the U.S. He mentioned that Kyrgyzstan was going to Mongolia for advice on political reform. Um, since Mongolia is a prime example of a former Soviet satellite state in Asia that successfully embraced democracy and has to navigate between U.S.-Russia-China relations. I was wondering if that is at all an indicator of Kyrgyzstan's willingness to move toward reform and if there has been any development to move in the direction that Mongolia has. Thank you. Okay, we'll take one more question. Uh, yes, in the, f in the far back, far rear. You can just get a microphone. There you are. Thanks. I'll, yeah. I'll just be very brief. Um, a lot of the questions have centered around the issue of the transit center at Manas, and certainly it's been an overriding priority of U.S. policy over the last decade. Uh, but looking ahead with the upcoming withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, that's likely to become a less pressing issue for U.S. foreign policy in Central Asia. I was just curious, as we look at the perspective of U.S. Kyrgyz relations in the next five and ten years, where the panel might see other policy priorities or how they see kind of a, a post-Manas U.S.-Kyrgyz relationship. Okay, uh, panel, do we want to respond to... Uh, I'll respond to the first question about the Kyrgyz youth, that they're not West friendly, it's true. Many, yeah. many of them are not West friendly because they were been educated in Kyrgyz schools, they still are uh, used in, in Kyrgyz schools where still most teachers are from Soviet Union. Uh, they are pension age because it's lowly paid, so new p teachers don't really come to work there. So they use still Soviet methods and Soviet textbooks. Uh, so that's bad, and also many of them watch, grow up watching Russian TV channels. It's, it's, they're much better than Kyrgyz TV channels. Uh, also, why youth, uh, there's greater influence on youth by Russia is because when youth go to Russia to work, uh, my cousins, many from the youth south of the country, all, everybody who can, they left to Russia. Uh, therefore, as a result, uh, many of them are Russia-friendly. And so, f f in order to, for them to be more liberal, more West-oriented, I think the U.S. has to increase efforts in supporting institutions such as AUCA. Uh, we, need more, we need 10 AUC AUCAs, yeah? we just have one. We need uh, more work and travel people coming to the U.S. We need more uh, green card holders, Kyrgyz green card holders, and more such. We need more Kyrgyz op people opening businesses in the U.S. <coughs> and such to, to improve Kyrgyz American ties. Uh, what about the compare the, the uh, possible influence of the Mongolian uh, model and what does that show? Does anyone want to speak about that? Uh, share a deal? Well, I will use <laughs> Russian again. Sorry. If we talk about Mongolia, you should notice that Я был в составе одной из первых делегаций по изучению а, демократического а, раз, опыта демократического развития Монголии в 1997 году. Действительно, опыт Монголии заслуживает большого внимания. И, в принципе, я был секретарем а, парламента Кыргызстана в межпарламентской, межпарламентском союзе, ну, IPU, да, International Parliamentary Union, где мы тесно работали с монгольскими коллегами в том числе. И, действительно, а, у них есть много полезно, чему можно поучиться. Например, в 2008 году а, два представителя, а, если не ошибаюсь, а, Фишер, Фишер Коэн, 
а, ну, два американских следователя составляли а, рейтинг а, парламентов мира. И монгольский парламент вошел, а, в, ну, это был один из лидирующих парламентов мира по всем параметрам, которые были изложены в методологии. В то время как парламенты Египта и других арабских стран занимали, ну, скажем так, далеко не ведущие места. Да? Вот, и а, особо отвечало, что парламент Монголии, как вы знаете, Монголия это парламентская система управления, да, которая стремится к Кыргызстану в том числе, а, очень эффективно работает а, с а, золоторудными, а, золотодобывающими а, предприятиями. А, как вы знаете, в Монголии очень много предприятий из Китая, Южной Кореи, Японии и так далее, занимающихся разработкой и добычей золота. И а, монголам удалось найти оптимальный баланс обеспечение интересов а, крупного бизнеса, а, иностранного, а, интересов местных бизнесменов монгольских и интересов государства. И вот, вот это действительно а, можно изучать и попробовать применить себя на практике. А, что касается вопроса о будущих направлениях сотрудничества а, Кыргызстана и США, я просто напомню о том, что существует а, как минимум два проекта, инициированные американской стороной, это Casa One Thousand, это Central Asia, South Asia One Thousand. Проект, предполагающий а, производство и переброску выработанной электроэнергии а, в Афганистан, Пакистан. Вот. И это долгосрочный проект, требует больших затрат, и он, в принципе, уже реализовывается. Да? Происходят регулярные встречи, и вот буквально месяца два назад, вот опять же, возвращаясь с отношением Китая, Китайский Нексимбанк объявил о том, что выделит порядка 150 миллионов долларов на строительство одной из подстанций, которая станет ключевой при транспортировке электроэнергии, производимой в Таджикистане и в Кыргызстане на территории Афганистана и Пакистана. А другой проект, который, в принципе, тоже инициирован, были большие дискуссии, в частности, вот представители Джонса, Джонс Хапкинс института принимали в нем участие, это строительство трех автомобильных дорог из трех портов, находящихся в Пакистане, вот, на территорию э, э, России и Казахстана. Ну и, соответственно, транзитная зона. Но здесь не речь идет не о Кыргызстане, а о Таджикистан, Узбекистан, Туркменистан. Да? Но мы же понимаем, когда идет большое количество э, грузов, когда выстраивают все вот эти структуры, соответственно, опять же, стоит вопрос номер один безопасности. Да? А дело в том, что Кыргызстан, он не впервые становится центром террористических атак, они происходили, первые произошли в 1998 году. За год, за два. И произошло это два года, да, до того, как случились вот известные события 9-11 в Нью-Йорке. Да? Вот. И должен сказать, что как раз боевики приходили с территории Афганистана. И это были люди разной национальной принадлежности. Да? Вот. И то есть это вот реалии наших дней, которые есть. И в соответствии с этим я полагаю, что есть достаточно много сильных оснований для того, чтобы сотрудничество и в области безопасности, и логистики, оно расширялось и продолжалось. Спасибо. Iran's development of a nuclear weapon. Um, how does that, uh, what effect does that have on uh, power relationships in the region? Um, what effect does uh, the possibility that um, Afghanistan uh, will revert to a base of terror have in the region? Um, what effect does the likelihood of a competition between China and Russia in the region have? Uh, I can ask these questions. I'm afraid I'm not able to answer them. Um, but I think that, uh, that, those, that those issues will play uh, a central, the central role uh, in answering the question about the United States' relationship with, uh, with Kyrgyzstan. 
Well, we've, we've run out of time. Thanks to all of you for coming, and thanks to our panelists for a fascinating presentation. Hello. Ah, nice to meet you. Oh, please leave your... Uh, Actually, what are, what are the, um, the, your translation devices on the chairs so we can pick them up. Thank you. Yeah. And I